Our last presenters uh, represent the important relationship between librarians and faculty. Uh, Jennifer Lott Jarson is an information literacy and assessment librarian, and Laura Tab Purvis Poor is an associate dean for digital learning and associate professor of media and communications at Muhlenberg College. Their talk outlines a pedagogy that focuses on collaborative research, linking students' content knowledge to their collab or I'm sorry, to their information literacy, and it's titled InfoGlut or Information Literacy, using blended learning for student research in new information technologies. While Jen fires up our oh, Esther's now. <laughs> We're all about collaboration. Um, I will hand out a couple um, low-tech artifacts for this talk. Um, the first, let's see, I'll keep on some pattern on this way and have on the other side. The first is the assignment we're going to discuss today. Fear not, we have a bit.ly link for those of you who are online and connected. This is two things. Yes, yeah, so I'm handing out two things. The second is part of the research methodology that we want to share with you. But as I said, for those of you online, we will have bit.ly links to both documents. You can pull up on your own devices. We may not actually have enough copies for everyone. But. All right, so Jen and I have been collaborating um, in an intense way for about three years in this particular course that I teach called New Information Technologies. I'm in the Department of Media and Communication. Jen is in the library. And we've had a particular interest in moving beyond um, the general the general ways that let, that the um, that the librarians and faculty work together at Muhlenberg. Students go to the library for an info, information session, maybe some other points of contact during the semester. But Jen and I have really been interested in a much deeper collaboration, and the blended learning has really helped facilitate this. In fact, it necessitates it. So in this particular course, um, which is primarily uh, taken by juniors and seniors is this looking right? Right. Okay. in media and communication, um, we're interested in introducing students, much like the prior um, Douglas's course, we're interested in introducing students to key concepts and tools for thinking critically about new information technology in a global network society, what it means to live in a digital world. But largely with Jen's help and collaboration and expertise, I've also developed in this course a very intense, some intentional goals around information literacy. So we're also interested in developing students' capacities as information literate learners who can discover, organize, analyze, create, and share information in order to achieve their goals, not only as learners, but as citizens of a global network society. So the course is trying to provide an, in, an intellectual framework for both. So quickly, our course objectives. I'm not going to read through them all here. You can see them here. The mustard color is intended to call out some of the key things here. But note bullet number four. Right, we're interested in developing their capacities as information literate learners. The core assignment in this class is an internet censorship assignment, the handout for which you all have. And do you have the bit link? That's the bit link. That's what it works. OK. So in this assignment, which extends across four weeks towards the latter half of the semester, Students working in pairs or small groups map internet censorship and surveillance in different countries. They choose a specific country, and they are guided in their selection by a couple lists that Jen and I have called over time that include like the Reporters Without Borders, Enemies of the Internet list, um, a list from the Open Net Initiative, Freedom on the Net. I'm going to say importantly, they can't choose the United States um, because collectively as a class, we examine internet uh, surveillance and censorship in the United States. And there's just that has just snowballed in the last two years with NSA and Snowden and 
um, the more waitresses work. So there's a lot of content there. And, and Jen and I work through the US model with them to model the kind of work we want them to do on, on their countries. So before Jen picks up um, with the next section of our presentation, I want to emphasize um, just the, the centrality of this partnership between Jen and myself in this assignment. Jen is in class all along the way at critical points from the day we introduce the assignment to the very end of the month-long process when they do their presentations. Right. So, um, as Laura mentioned, can everyone hear me okay? As Laura mentioned, um, we've been doing this assignment over a few years, and initially in our first um, iteration, and even in our second iteration, we're now on our third, entering our fourth soon, um, we really felt that we saw um, some issues with students, uh, what we're calling here information dump. And I imagine this is not something that's unfamiliar to you, right? We often see students do this, um, where students amass a large amount of information and then just dump that into either uh, written work that they submit or dump that into presentations that they give. Students aren't critically engaging with information. That's a challenge that we um, often think students are experiencing, and we think that that's, thank you, we think that's indicative of students' larger issues with research process, too, with critical engagement in process and information selection and sort of engagement overall. So um, I hope this video, this little animated GIF, plays well enough for you to see. Um, <laughs> what is the uh, long winter, right? <laughs> in winter when we found this, we, um, we needed a sense of humor. We hope you enjoy a little bit of cat humor, yeah. Um, so here what we're trying to demonstrate are some of the challenges that we think students have experienced in the past, of course, um, not quite making the leap, right, that we want them to. They're not bridging these gaps in the ways that we hope. Um, so pedagogically speaking, what we've tried to do is to better model for them the um, not just the outcomes, but the behaviors and the processes that we're interested in, and to better scaffold, right, to sort of help build that bridge toward this, in this case, this balcony for this poor little cat, but for our students <laughs> as well, to their eventual um, not just performance of outcomes, but actual um, adoption of behaviors and outcomes too along the way. Um, so we've done that um, in this iteration, specifically with our um, in-class instruction, with in-class discussion and in-class hands-on work, as well as the structure of the assignment itself, which you can see in your handouts and the bit link here I think is on the next screen. So what we can see here, um, if you want to access that, that's bit.ly slash NIT, standing for New Information Technologies 2014. Really, we want to highlight with this, with this slide here that we're using three different tools to help facilitate this assignment, but of course what we care about are what the tools help us do, right? So through Google Drive, um, we ask students to, in their teams or their, with their partner, to, um, to create an evolving document throughout the course of their research that they use to gather the information that they are discovering through their research processes to then, um, as it evolves, to meaningfully organize their information and also to show evidence of how they're evaluating that information. So in class, we model that, and then students embark on that work throughout the course of the project. Using WordPress, which is the part we're going to talk about in most detail here in just a moment, um, students, uh, this is the photo journal element of the assignment. So students individually represent um, in, with uh, text, with na their narrative text, and with images, their, their research process and practices. Um, and then they use Prezi, finally, with their, their partner or their team to present that information and share it with their peers. So you can see those phases sort of outlined on the assignment. We also here, just, have, just to call your attention, especially to the photo journal, which we're going to talk about in more detail, um, the purpose of the photo journal was really to help students bridge that gap, the leap that we didn't see the cat make, um, where we want students to engage more critically, to be more metacognitive and reflect on their process and practice, and hopefully by uncovering their thinking for themselves to dig deeper, dive deeper into it, and then also to uncover it for us as well, of course, to see where they're, um, what they're doing um, and what they're thinking. So this is just an example. We're going to look more at a few examples of students' photo journals. This is Tess, and um, we have to admit that Tess was our uh, most engaged student, perhaps. So we're going to look at examples from more, um, from most engaged and lesser engaged students, perhaps. But we can see here, I love this photo, Tess took of herself, and we can see that, um, uh, I don't know how to describe it, that anguish. anguish, that's a great word for it, anguish on her face. 
And so in here, I think she's describing the challenges she often experiences with research, um, the overwhelming amount of information that she typically feels um, overwhelmed by and uh, experiences anguish about, um, her struggles with organizing that information and making connections between information sources. So what she's describing here, I think, demonstrates the way that this newest iteration of the assignment has helped her to sort of, has helped um, lay out that process for her and has sort of fostered for her some improvements um, that help, has helped her to more effectively navigate the process and her thinking, I think. So Laura's gonna talk a little bit about her methodology of looking at student work. All right, so we were really interested in um, diving into the photo journal. The students had 10 required journal entries. We had 17 students. We had quite a bit of journal content to sort through. And to assist us in this qualitative content analysis, we used an online um, mixed methods uh, program or, or tool for qualitative analysis called Deduce. And um, so since the course ended in, uh, in December of 2014, Right. We, um, we imported all journal entries, so 17 students, 10 entries each. Um, we imported them, the text, and, the text and the images, into Deduce. And we then coded this media according to a coding scheme, the handout for which you are holding, and I'll give you the bit.ly link to it in just a second. Um, a coding scheme that we generated and honed literally over, sev over several months, right up until last week when we were kind of nailing down our talk for today, we were questioning our, our categories um, that we coded. So here you see the bit.ly link if you want to look at the um, document version of this online. But what I really want to call attention to in particular um, is that there were two, there were three broad categories that we were coding for that really spoke to the, the, re, the, the goals of the photo journal itself, as Jen described it. We were especially interested in the extent to which students were focused in their personal journal on content, finding content, choosing content, needing content, and the extent to which they were focused on process, the process of researching, the process of creating their presentation. Um, and so we each coded half of the journals, and we met to discuss our coding scheme at multiple points throughout the last semester. Two key questions really shape our analysis for now. Got it, okay. I need to go back. Can digital tools, can digital tools in a blended learning context be used in ways to help foreground the process of research, which remains fairly mystified for many students, and to help foster students' identities and agency as researchers. So let me give you a quick bird's eye view of the coding. We applied two very broad categories to indicate the quality of the journals, robust journals and limited journals. Generally, robust referred to those journals that demonstrated engagement in the research process that had a depth and a detail and just a general thoughtfulness, oftentimes incorporating the prompts, the journal prompts that Jen and I provide in the assignment handout. Um, we offered those prompts as options. Interestingly, and something we're thinking about for our next iteration, the most robust journals were the ones that used our prompts. So good prompts, Jen. <laughs> um, so the limited journals, in contrast, um, they met the requirements. They posted 10 times. But they didn't go beyond that. Their, post, their posts were shorter and oftentimes very formulaic. I found this article. Here's my summary of the article. Here's what I'm going to do next. Let me give you a bird's eye view of another broad category that was very important to us, and that is pacing. We begin from the assumption that students' ability to pace their research will influence their outcome, their research outcome, as well as their experience of the research process. So another assumption here is that research takes time. 
research is a process, an iterative process. So here what you see um, is that robust journals were pretty spread across our four broad categories. Um, two robust journals actually fall into the poor pacing category. Poor may mean that, um, that it was a very compressed time frame. So rather than the whole month, um, there was a little bit of activity in week one, a little bit of activity in week two, and then in week four, there's this 24-hour period where they posted a couple times. For limited journals, which overwhelmingly fall in the core category, for some students that meant a little activity in week one, nothing in the next two weeks, and then in a 24-hour period, six or seven posts. Um, we had one pair who technically most of their research happened on two days, but it was really a Wednesday and a Thursday between 11 p.m. and, and 1 a.m. So really one day. <laughs> okay. So um, so this slide I think is really important, and it tells us that you know perhaps robust journals like Tess's journal are robust for any number of reasons: the nature of the student, the use of prompts. Re, you know, stronger research skills. And it also suggests that perhaps limited journals are limited at least in part because of poor pacing, which we take to be a sign, an indicator also, of low engagement. All right. So I'm going to try and walk through a little bit of the data, and I'm going to try not to overwhelm you or bore you, bore you rather, um, with charts. So apologies if this is difficult to see. How does that look for you? You see I have five minutes. Okay. Oh, five minutes. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so first, I just want to give you a general sense. This is in the blue column, right? We're looking at all journals. In the yellow column, we're looking at just robust journals. And in the green, we're looking at uh, limited journals. The grouping on the left is about content. The one on the right is about process. Apologies if those access labels are too small. So really, what we see here um, is that in limited journals, students wrote more about content. And in robust journals, students wrote more about process, right? So sort of consistent with what we've been describing. So we see those robust journals um, engage students engaging more with that process. We could talk in more detail. I'm just going to touch on the highlights here to call your attention. Um, if you can't see the, oops, that's not helpful. Oh, no. Sorry about that. Um, if you can't see the, the bottom here, we're looking at now more in more detail the content codes broken down into our most frequent content codes that we saw evidence of. Summary of sources in the first grouping, opinion making and judgment in the second, meaning making in the third, and information evaluation in the fourth. So this can align with your coding scheme handout if you have one of those. So here what we can really see is that summary of sources was um, an activity commonly occurring for both robust and limited journals. But really, we see some differentiation for limited journals doing a lot more opinion making, right? Taking a stand, making um, a personal claim on this, whereas more robust journals were engaging in order with the information in order to make meaning of it, right? I'm going to show you an example of an excerpt to better illustrate that. Um, so we might think of um, the ones on the right, meaning making and information evaluation as higher order skills, as more difficult. Uh, and so information evaluation especially, we don't see very much of that more advanced skill perhaps or intentionally done, but still more with robust there. Anecdotally, the summary, if it happened for everyone, robust students typically, as we can see, paired that with meaning making, whereas limited students paired that with opinion making. So here's an example of a student, sorry if this quote is a little bit too long, um, but basically here Sarah is trying to make meaning of a source that she, um, that she found Meaning making we mean that she's interpreting it. She's trying to integrate it into her knowledge base. She's trying to connect it to the other information she's found. Um, so that's uh, typical of what we saw when we mean meaning making. Here, Jesse is talking, um, is, is more taking a stand or making opinions in this case, right? He's essentially uh, reinforcing his um, assumptions rather than challenging them. So he's relying on his personal experience as an American citizen to, uh, to relate to what he's reading and learning about in the United Kingdom. Moving on quickly. Um, so here we just see a little bit more of the process codes broken down, right? So we had a lot more categories, as you might have noted in your handout, for process, and that's why we see more on the screen here. So rather than go through them, I'll just call your attention to the right side of the screen and call those perhaps lower order skills. And on the left side of the screen, we'll, I mean, this is obviously open for discussion, but we'll call those higher order skills. So we're sort of working up the chart 
Um, and we'll see here, I think, that robust journals engage a lot more frequently with those higher order skills, um, where we see uh, the limited journals really lacking that kind of engagement and instead relying more on describing what they did, right? I went to the library website and searched for this, and then I found this, rather than saying, um, well, here's what I found, here's why I chose what I found, and here's what I'm going to do next in order to, to advance my research and, and engage with this information. So here's a quick quote, another one from Tess that describes maybe one of those categories. This is about her organization, and here's one of the images that she posted. It might be hard to make out. She's describing here the number of tabs she has open at any given time, how she generally feels about that in sort of an affective way, um, and then what this process has done for her and sort of, excuse me, how she can manage her organization differently because of, of the, um, the process. I know we're running very short on time, so sorry for moving quickly here. In the identity category, you might remember one of our questions was how does this project or these blended learning tools and this pedagogical structure help students engage um, and identify themselves as researchers to locate themselves in the process. And generally, we saw that that was not something that students frequently talked about. On this slide, we have three groupings, the low ones, the short ones, that are really specific to identity codes, but then we've gathered in the path next steps here as well. That comes from the research process category because we felt that to, um, to talk about a path or a next step in an intentional way does situate the student in that research process. So you can see that lower order part of identity is really what's happened, what's driving the identity conversation and the other information or the other codes here are less prevalent. We expected that, right? That's a challenge that really um, something that we expect students who are more advanced to begin engaging with. So there's a quick quote here from Hannah to describe the, you know, the ownership and the expertise she felt she cultivated and what that felt like to her to sort of be that resident expert in the class on her topic. So generally speaking, there's some takeaways here that I think um, Laura can start us off with as well. Okay, so um, we are seeing in this analysis that blended learning can help model and practice information literacy with our students. Importantly, it can make learning visible. So the Google Doc, the photo journal on WordPress made students' learning visible to them, also to us. Blended learning can help students be have greater agency in their learning, be agents in their learning, own it in the ways that, that Hannah describes in, in that quote previously. And that it can help deepen students' intentionality, focus, and the impact of assignments on student learning and development. Um, so designing blended learning is itself an iterative process. By focusing on better blending with a single assignment over three years, we've really been able to deepen, deepen our sense of what we want this assignment to do and why we're picking the particular tools that we're picking. So we'll just end by sharing with you our future research areas. We want to continue to explore collaboration and independent reflection. We want to continue to dig deeper into some of what Jen introduced me to as um, uh, high, high threshold or threshold concepts in information literacy. Um, and, and just some of the, some of the deeper indications of um, of a more robust engagement as information literate learners than just, I found an article, I, I really like that article, to the, the, thing, the, the you know, ability to, to really um, critically examine a particular source and integrate it with prior knowledge and be the expert on that knowledge. So, thank you very much.